Hello and welcome to my channel. I am Bearded Dev. In this video, we're going to be talking about the age old problem of comparing multiple columns in SQL. As you can see on screen here, I'm trying to simulate sort of a, a slowly changing dimension process, but this applies to anywhere you need to compare multiple columns. Now we have our, our first table, which is our, our customer staging. As we can see, we've got the source key and we're going to be using that to join the data on. And then we've got some attributes related to people or customers. And that is actually what we're going to be comparing. Now I've set this up so I can see that uh, our original Deborah Austin has actually changed her title and her last name. And I can see in the third row as well, Carl Smith has actually now moved address. So these are the kinds of things that we want to actually detect. And we're going to be going through a few methods of how we can carry out these checks to um, find out when a, when a value within any of those columns has changed. And we'll be introducing some new SQL functions that should be available in whatever version of SQL you are using. Now, if you do enjoy the video or are interested in anything in regards to data engineering or data analysis, do subscribe to the channel and check out the other videos. If you do enjoy the video, don't forget to hit that thumbs up button and comment below your thoughts. I do really uh, appreciate it and it does help the channel grow. Now the first approach I've got here on screen, as I mentioned in the introduction, we will be joining these two tables on source key. But what we're actually doing within our where clause then is comparing every single column to see if any of them have actually changed. And as we can see, this process is a bit tedious. I don't actually have a large amount of columns here. But if I did, I would have to write out a very long where clause to compare. But if we go ahead and execute that query and have a look at that results, that's at least going to give us a starting point. So we can see out of the three customers, we're just working with a small sample of data here. Out of those three customers, we can see we are getting the correct results back. We've identified that Deborah title and name has changed although it doesn't tell me specifically what's changed within this query it's just that something has changed and the same for Carl as well so that's the traditional or old school approach is just to compare every single column but SQL uh, in, in and within uh, T SQL Microsoft SQL Server or Azure SQL database there are a few different functions we could use to have a look at this process. And that's what we're going to have a look at in this video. So I've actually written out the queries prior to recording as it just saves me, you watching me type. So the first option we've got is checksum. And if we have a look at checksum, what that actually does is computes an integer value for what we pass in. So if I just have a look at a checksum on the customer staging table, we can see we get an integer value returned for a comma separated list of columns that we pass in. So if we just amend that, what we can actually do is within our where clause, we are again doing the same join on source key and then passing in our columns from table A to a checksum and then doing a not equal to our columns from table B. So if we have a look at running this query and if it's not clear on screen they will be available in the description as well. So we get exactly the same results. So there's our four, first option we have the checksum function. But when it comes to checksum there are some limitations. It works quite well in this case because we're only working with a small amount of data. The first limitation is checksum will return an integer value. So we are limited on the amount of unique combinations we can create. I think off the top of my head it's something like 
4.294 million, the range of an integer data type. So that means if we had customers exceeding that amount, then we'd have some what are called collisions. And that is where we pass different values into the function, but it returns the same checksum value. So that's something to bear in mind. Now the other thing is dashes and trailing spaces are ignored. So I've got some examples here, and as you can see, I've got one and minus one as strings, and the minus one has got some trailing spaces after it. Now trailing spaces, probably not a bad thing to have those ignored. Um, typically we don't really enter values with trailing spaces on purpose. So if I execute this, we can see that those actually return the same value. So in this case, we can see that that dash is completely ignored. And again, trailing spaces, but like I say, that wouldn't be a concern. The other problem is case sensitivity. So again, if we want to check certain values, but we are working with case sensitive data, uh, probably not traditional in a database, but yeah, if we are working with case sensitive data, then that's something to bear in mind. If I pass in lowercase bearded dev and uppercase bearded dev, again, they're going to return the same checksum value. So the next step is how do we get over these limitations? Well, there's a sort of an, another function, binary checksum. And again, that is going to return an integer value. If I just show you that in the select, that's again going to return an integer value. So if we go ahead and pass in our columns to binary checksum, execute the query, we can see we get the two results as we'd expect, which is, which is great. Um, but again, binary checksum will come with limitations. The first is again, exactly the same as checksum. So we are limited by the data type so again, we could have that collision there. Uh, dashes and trailing spaces are considered. So if we compare the same examples, we can see we'll get different values for the one and minus one with the trailing spaces. Case sensitivity is also considered. So we get different values for uppercase and lowercase bearded dev. But we do have a limitation of strings it will only compare the first 255 characters and if you have a look at this string here what I've set and we just check the length of this string 255 characters and I do believe that deserves a like for how I've managed to do that so that string is hello and welcome to my channel I am bearded dev in this video we'll be discussing how to compare multiple columns in SQL Want to learn more about data engineering and data analysis then subscribe to the channel if you are enjoying the video hit the so what we're going to do is compare a binary checksum on the string as original uh, and then we're going to concatenate that string with to hear your thoughts at the end which admittedly is my mistake should be hit the like button that makes sense and I've now revealed that I had to work quite hard to get that string to 255 characters so if we go ahead and have a look at that uh, and we'll see so we can see the length is 255 the original uh, which is just a binary checksum on that string has been returned as this value here ending in 108 minus um, and then exactly the same has happened when we've added, we've concatenated like button. So we do have that problem with binary checksum. So overcomes some of the limitations of checksum, but introduces some others. So there is a third approach, and this is my preferred approach as well. Uh, and if we, this is the hash bytes function. And if we actually have a look at the documentation 
on Microsoft Docs there's just this paragraph I want to read out here so if at least one of the values in the expression list changes the checksum will probably change however this is not guaranteed therefore to detect whether values have changed we recommend use of checksum only if your app application can tolerate an occasional mischange. So if you're happy that some changes may be missed then checksum could be a good choice. Otherwise consider using hash bytes instead. The probability that hash bytes will return the same result for two different inputs is much lower compared to checksum. I think it's well over the the billions actually of hash bytes compared to uh, checksum. So let's have a look at hash bytes. And hash bytes is not just let's go straight to hash bytes, it does come with its own limitations. So the first is as we can see here, we need to choose an algorithm. Um, so there's some algorithms that are more legacy that do still function but will return sort of a deprecated event in your database and I'll leave a link to the Microsoft Docs page on those um, in the description so you can have a bit of more look into detail of that. The, the major problem with hash bytes is it can only accept one value so we're going to have to concatenate our string which we're doing here and then we're passing that into the hash bytes function and the first thing we declare is the algorithm and then the string we're actually passing in. So again if I drop that into the select and we have a look at that look what that looks like and we'll see a major difference here is that hash bytes re returns a, a binary value a var binary value rather than the integer so we can see there the range of the uh, different values we could have and again uh, we'd apply that to our B table as well so if we have a look at running that then again we're getting exactly the same results so limitations in terms of hash bytes we're gonna pay a small penalty in terms of performance because of how the algorithm works there's a different range of values uh, and then because we need to apply that can cap concatenation. A uh, thing to bear in mind with hash bytes as well is we will need to add a separator. So best practice is to add something into our concat, perhaps a pipe for example if commas are available in the data then we need to add that in. Um, so if I look at this simple example here where I'm comparing the concatenation of 1 and 10 to 110. If we have a look at the hash bytes that's returned, we can see on screen they're exactly the same value. So that's why we need to add that separator in. Uh, and you should choose a separator that's not going to exist within your, your data. So pipe is a traditional one that I would choose. Lastly, the recommendation I would make would be to actually store these hash bytes values, these, well, what the values that the hash bytes function actually returns. So I'd actually store that var binary value within the data itself. Um, otherwise, we're going to end up with some complex comparisons in terms of what we're doing within our where clauses. Um, but also we can't really have visibility of how that data has been processed. So imagine this runs daily um, and we, we see some changes that we, we can't understand why it's happened. It would be very easy to see when we can have the hash bytes columns available in both tables. So I'll just go through a quick recommendation of that. So if we alter our customer staging table and add in our hash match, well I'm calling the column hash match, uh, we then update our customer staging. Of course this would normally be within the, the insert process into our customer staging table. 
we do the same within customer and again apply the same update and then we can then do a simple select again we're going to join on source key but then we only actually have to compare those two columns if we execute that query we can see One, now we have got two, this column with uh, a lot of uh, maybe not easy to understand what that value is but it makes it easier if I was to look back and say well okay we've this customers changed today why um, it, it just makes it easier for debugging so that would actually be my recommendation and that's a process I typically implement especially for SCDs within uh, within stored procedures really hope you have enjoyed that video like I said I'd love to get your thoughts in the comments below um, if you're not already a subscriber hit that subscribe button there is lots of great content on the channel um, I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a lot for watching.